Many years ago, there was this daft idea that if you could combine a jet engine and a rocket engine into a single engine, and then somehow use the liquid hydrogen fuel to cool the air going into that engine as it went to high speed, then we might be able to make an aeroplane that could take off like an aeroplane, fly into space, do a job, land, and then a couple of days later, turn it around and do it again. Not only that, we could do it for maybe a 50th of the cost that it costs currently to get into space, but we could do it much more safely. Those were the three sort of major hits that we were trying to achieve. Um, one, on the safety front, uh, at the present time, one in every 50 rockets roughly finishes up in the nearest ocean instead of in an Earth orbit. And we think that we can get that very, very early on to at least a thousand times improvement uh, on that record. So that was the goal. Now, what about the technology? It required quite a lot of new technologies, but also, surprisingly, a great many of the old ones. So much of the technology designed for jet engines, rocket engines, that can all be used. With regard to the structure of the vehicle, an amazing thing happened because it's got so much liquid hydrogen on it, which it is very, very low density, it means the aeroplane's got a huge volume, it re-enters the atmosphere like a balloon. So surprisingly, when it comes back, it's much, much cooler than the space shuttle. And that enabled us to look at materials which were already being developed so that the aeroplane itself also seemed uh, immediately doable. So provided we could address just a few core outstanding technologies, all of the other things to make this happen are already with the industry. All the industries that you've seen around here in these halls, those people out there can do most of this vehicle. So what were these core technologies? Well, there was some interesting combustion stuff, some interesting turbines, and we did those over the past few years. Those are in our bank, we've done them. And the last one, of course, which you all know about, which we've all been holding our breath on, is the pre -cool. That is the component which has to take in the air, cool it down to minus 150. It starts at about 1,000 degrees C when it enters the engine. So that's a stupendous cooling job. The real heat exchange of 400 megawatts, and we can only allow about one and a quarter tons to engineer it in. That same heat exchange in a power station would be 200 tons. Now we actually achieved that. We've actually designed that. We built the modules. We set up a prototype production plant in Abingdon. Uh, the team there, the so-called Bradley Group, as they're now known, they achieved a miracle. They showed all that could be done, and it can be done in production circumstances. So we're not talking about something that you can do only once in some laboratory uh, uh, atmosphere. So the next thing, of course, was to actually build a pre-cooler, a small one, put it in front of a, jet, a Viper jet engine and see whether it actually works. And the answer is yes, it does. We've uh, so far done two experimental campaigns. The first one was entirely about aerodynamics. How does the air flow through this heat exchange? Is it stable? Is it uniform? Uh, does it wobble around as it goes into the jet engine? Does it develop well? And the answers to all of those things, absolute success. Can we actually control the aerodynamics? We've shown that we can actually control that very, very accurately. We can make the air do pretty well what we want it to do. It's also shown us that it wants to do things we didn't want it to do. I don't want to go into those because one of the great advantages of having done these tests we now know lots of things that I, I have to say, and Sam likes this statement, there are no textbooks in this area, but if there were, we'd have rewritten them anyway. What we've actually found as we've gone into testing this program, we are now in possession of huge amounts of information about what happens in this hardware that other people don't have. The second campaign, we went into pre-cooled testing. Now, we've achieved temperatures substantially below zero, uh, certainly well below minus 10, and uh, we've achieved that in uh, completely stable circumstances for about six minutes. Um, we intended to go much lower, and we were trying to get lower for the meeting today, but I'm afraid any of you who have ever had any experience of development rigs know that the biggest problem is not the kit you're testing, but the rig you're testing it on. So we've taken advantage of a need to upgrade our test rig to bring this here so that uh, you and the rest of the industry can actually see what we've got. Now yesterday there was a very flattering comment made about reaction engines by the Farnborough organisers. It's great to see some real hardware on test rather than plastic models and drawings of what you intend to do. And I think all of you can share in the pride that we feel of that statement 
because that was the intention of getting it here. This is real hardware, it's in test, the program's going extremely well. So I think that's probably enough for you to say at that point. Uh, obviously, as the